Grace, mercy and peace be with you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And also with you. Welcome. Welcome to this Church of England Sunday service for the 10th Sunday after Trinity. This morning's service comes from Mucknell Abbey near Worcester in the West Midlands. My name is Brother Stuart and I'm a member of this community of monks and nuns, Anglican and Methodist who live here. Our ages range from 27 to me at 74, which makes me the grandpa. We're part of the Order of St. Benedict, which has been on the go for something like 1500 years, though our particular community was founded only in 1941 with the special intention of praying for Christian unity, an intention which has broadened into praying for the peace and unity of people of all faiths and none. Because we wanted to live more simply and sustainably, 12 years ago we sold our old monastery in Oxfordshire and bought this place. At the time, it was a derelict farm. When we bought it, we didn't know that for at least five centuries before King Henry VIII closed the monasteries in the 1530s, this farm was owned by the Benedictine monks of Worcester Cathedral. It's recorded in the great Doomsday Book of 1086 as Mutton Hill, and the name, like the mud, has stuck. In his rule, St. Benedict says that guests are to be received as Christ. All sorts of people come here to share something of our life. Some simply pop in for a service, some for a few hours of peace and quiet, some for a few days of retreat, and some young people come for several months to live alongside the community, sometimes as part of a gap year, sometimes as an exploration of their sense of calling. And Benedict says that monasteries are never without guests, but since the COVID-19 lockdown in March, we have been without either guests or visitors, and it has felt decidedly odd so you are particularly welcome to share the service with us this morning. Now back in the 1850s, this farm was rebuilt as a model farm with the buildings round a rectangular farmyard. Apart from the old farmhouse, all the buildings have been kept and refurbished. Wherever possible, we've used recycled and locally sourced materials. We have solar panels and photovoltaic cells on the roofs to heat the water and generate the electricity. The monastery is heated by a biomass boiler and all the rainwater is harvested to flush the toilets. The waste goes into a biodigester and then on into reed beds. The farm is reduced to 40 acres and we've planted several thousand woodland trees, as well as orchards. We've developed a huge kitchen garden where we grow as much of our food as possible. Looking after it all, as well as running a large household and caring for our guests and visitors, on top of our principal work of prayer, study and generating income to pay the bills, is more than enough to keep us occupied. Now, during the service, you will meet our abbot, Thomas, who will read the Gospel, our two novices, Sister Jessica, who will share her testimony, and we'll hear Sister Gregory as she sings a piece written by Hildegard of Bingen, a Benedictine nun born in 1098. Brother Adrian will read the first lesson, preach, and lead the intercessions. But now, let's join the community in our chapel singing one of our morning hymns. Thank you. 
to God's word, we ask forgiveness for all that has been amiss in our lives and in the world. For God our Creator, we come to you asking for the gift of repentance. Lord have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For Christ our Redeemer, we come to you asking for the gift of forgiveness. Christ have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. O Holy Spirit, our Sanctifier, we come to you asking for the gift of wholeness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sin, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm Sister Jessica and I've been here at Mucknall Abbey for three years. I was clothed as a novice two years ago, having spent a year living alongside the community before that. Being clothed as, as a novice meant that I was given a habit to wear and also that I officially became a nun. One of the most distinctive aspects of our life, I think, is our prayer. We're Benedictines and in his rule, Benedict calls our corporate prayer what we call the daily office the opus dei, the work of God. Prayer is our job, essentially. We also engage in all the work of running a large household, managing our estate and gardens, and in more normal times, welcoming guests. But all of that work is aimed at making possible and sustaining our real work, where we gather in chapel seven times each day to pray the office and celebrate the Eucharist. The majority of the office consists of saying or singing the psalms, and it's this aspect of our work in particular that has opened up my heart in so many ways over the last three years. In my first months at Mucknell, I was very struck and surprised by the anger present in the psalms, and I found it very difficult. Anger's an emotion that I have a hard time with, and imagining God angry was, was almost impossible and quite upsetting. And then one morning we came to Psalm 18, which begins with the psalmist in trouble and distress. He calls out to God in desperation, and then we read, God heard my voice from his heavenly dwelling. My cry of anguish came to his ears. The earth reeled and quaked. The roots of the mountain shook. They reeled because of his anger. The Lord thundered out of heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He reached down from on high and grasped me. He drew me from the great waters. He delivered me from my strong enemies and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. He brought me out into an open place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Those verses opened my eyes to a completely different way of seeing God's anger anger here at the way a precious child is being treated, anger that causes God to storm down from heaven and essentially say, don't you treat my child that way. It was a revelatory moment for me, both in terms of an acceptance of strong emotions, if God can have them, then maybe they're okay, and also amazement that God would come to our defence, 
to my defence with such passion. Strong emotions like anger are still not always my forte, but coming round to this psalm every other Wednesday keeps, helps to keep my heart open to an aspect of God and of life that maybe I don't always find comfortable and might otherwise ignore. The psalms also keep my heart open to the needs of the world. Pretty much every human experience finds its expression in the psalms. Joy, praise, delight, love, anger, despair, betrayal, depression, vengeance, and much more besides. Just occasionally we hit a psalm that expresses perfectly to God how I'm feeling in that moment, but much more often that's not the case, nor do I expect it to be. And in that moment, the psalm that I don't identify with today reminds me that someone, somewhere, is feeling this, does need to say this to God, but maybe doesn't have the words, but I and we can have them and pray them for and with that person, even though they know nothing about it and we don't know who they are. Even the psalms about vengeance, which many people find profoundly challenging, open my heart to the complexity of humanity and especially the challenges inherent in peacemaking and in breaking cycles of anger and revenge. The psalms keep my heart and my prayer open to God and to the needs of the world and for that I'm profoundly grateful for them and their place in our lives here at Mucknall. And now the collect for today. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions, make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord 
and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today's Gospel poses many questions, but today I wish to focus on just one central aspect, 
the Canaanite woman's humility and perseverance, and the hope this can kindle in us for, through Jesus' healing and mercy. First to the Canaanite woman. If we see her not simply as a Canaanite woman, but the symbol of humankind, indeed the whole creation, then who with all honesty can examine themselves and not hear that cry for mercy welling up inside them? Who cannot hear the groans of the earth as it suffers under the weight of our resistance to this truth? The truth is that we are all in need of the love and the mercy of God. True humility is the recognition of the reality of who we are, with all our faults, and the recognition that the only way we can be made whole is not by our own endeavours, but by the mercy of God, who already greatly loves us as we are. The Canaanite woman represents the image of how we ourselves need to be in front of God. Jesus shows in his healing and forgiveness how we need to be with each other. Looking at the human-induced crises that the world is facing today, we are facing climate change, child poverty, regular pandemics, huge disparities between rich and poor. With these issues and more, this is no time to be looking in on ourselves, putting up barriers and turning away from our responsibilities, building our fortresses of various degrees of nationalism on the foundations of the quicksand of fear and an excessive reliance on ourselves. This is the false vision for survival and the reality of what we are seeing going up around our world today. There is, however, another reality, another vision, one rooted in the Gospels and in our readings today, one full of hope and much needed in the current times. The passage from Isaiah speaks both of covenant and of bringing others to God, others in addition to the house of Israel. By using the language of covenant, it is a great reminder of how God's faithfulness is proven by his promises being fulfilled in the scriptures. Our gospel reading today confirms this. Jesus crosses the border to meet the Canaanite woman, and the woman crosses the cultural boundary in her search for mercy and healing. They turn away from themselves and their homes, and towards an encounter with each other, one in repentance and need, the other in mercy and compassion for the one who believes. In the somewhat fearful and confused times that we are in, it is easy to try and simplify, compartmentalise our groups of people, to turn inwards in prioritising our desires. It is also understandable to fear rejection if we do step across boundaries. Today's Gospel reading is a challenge to some of our natural inclinations, and instead of closing in on ourselves, to reach out in compassion and mercy as we are, and not to give up our hope in the redemptive power of God, that power to lift us out of our fears and our errors, to show mercy, and to transform us to become more fully who we are, to set us free. The Canaanite woman, when first seemingly ignored and rebuffed, did not give up. She persevered in hope. Sometimes when our own faith is hanging by a thread, when evil or indifference appear to be taking hold, or we face rejection, it is easy to try and protect ourselves and walk away from life's challenges. But the Gospel should give us courage not to lose hope in these circumstances, and instead to continue to turn to outwards in love, to continue in prayer, and in the hope and knowledge that God does not fail to fulfil his promises, and his grace towards us has no boundaries. Life in a Benedictine community 
teaches many things, but especially the need for mercy, that power of hope in the grace of God to overcome weakness of faith, the maintenance of hope and perseverance in the face of struggles, and the gradual growth of humility and love that comes through such perseverance are some of the main aspects. St. Benedict's rule teaches us to treat the other as Christ, seeing Christ in the other person, who perhaps I can't stand, who differs from me in most ways, who in most areas is completely foreign to me. This is one of the most challenging aspects of the love. But it also follows the teaching of today's Gospel, and is most rewarding. We don't need to fear. We don't need to give up hope. We can turn outwards towards others, not just to family, friends and neighbours. We need to continue to expand our horizons, our boundaries of compassion and love, in the hope of the coming of Christ and our salvation. We should turn to the refugee, to the stranger, Turn to the person we struggle to get on with, the outcast. Share with them that compassion, that healing and mercy that Christ shows to the Canaanite woman. And we should always turn in prayer for the healing of ourselves and of our world. If we are rejected, we should not lose hope. Let's not underestimate the power of our witness to God's grace, even if it is not apparent at the time, nor underestimate our personal testimonies to the history of redemption in Jesus Christ. Let's continue to persevere, continue to turn to the other in mercy, compassion and love. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with us and the love and joy of the risen and ascended Lord Jesus dwell and grow in our hearts, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You've heard some of our chant. It's relatively simple. Uh, as I said, Hildegard of Bingen was a Benedictine nun, and her works include extensive correspondence and writings, including chant melodies that are much more elaborate than the standard chant. Sister Gregory is now going to sing one of her chants. Lord Jesus, you showed mercy and healing to the Canaanite woman. Strengthen your church that we may be a channel of your love in the cause of justice. We pray for Archbishop Justin and all who lead your church, that they may do so with humble hearts and in the cause of truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, the Canaanite woman turned to you in the need of mercy. Help us to be humble and show compassion to a troubled world 
and me to be. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you responded to the faith of the Canaanite woman and healed her daughter. Bring healing and hope to all who are in distress or sickness at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you raised Lazarus from the dead to new life in you. We pray for all who have died. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord, and, and may the light of the dead shine, shine upon them. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Benedict and all the saints, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Merciful God, I accept these prayers for the, the sake of your Son, our, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, we pray. Our Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.